Welcome, friends, to the How To Heretic. I'm Uncle Mark. And I'm Uncle Dan. And I'm Uncle Doug. And this is your user's guide to life on the outside. Boy, howdy. Leaving religion is the first step into a larger, better world. However, it can also be a scary world. <laughs> Things work differently now. Never fear. That's why we are here. We are your audio uncles. And with help from good friends and experts in all sorts of fields, we're going to share the stories and seek the knowledge to build a great life. After all, you only get the one that we know of, so you better make the most of it. Happy, happy almost Halloween there, uncles. Ooh, yes. Yes. Spooky. The, the time of year when children used to go out and get candy before... <laughs> Back before we were plagued. before permanent Halloween, <laughs> yeah. before the before time. <laughs> um, so yes, uh, fun show today. I'm actually going to reference Halloween, and I'm going to talk about another bullshit American myth that uh, is trying to ruin all our fun. <laughs> yeah, and I I too will be a, a little themey on the Halloween thing and talk about the person that you are picturing every time someone says witch. Yeah, the proto the proto alphabet. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and then I'm going to bring it home by completely ruining the theme and talking about leading a discussion on the paucity of atheists in our government that represent us and what we can do about it, maybe. And yeah. also what the word paucity means. It doesn't mean anything. He just it's made my it word. Of, it's my word of the day calendar. <laughs> so there you go. It's going to be a fun show. So let's just uh, jump in. <laughs> Hey, Uncle Doug. Ho. Uh, you know, it is a spooky time of year. Mm. Uh, it is a, it is a, it's a, there, there's fun for all, for everyone. Do you mean election season? I was yes, say. indeed. Yeah. It's, uh, that's less fun, but, uh, but it's still like tremendously spooky. Matter Trick or fact, cheat, may, I think that's called. This may be the spookiest of all of them. The, this yeah, it's, it's a spooky time of a spooky year, you know, in a spooky age. On a yes, spooky-ass planet. Yeah. Uh, but I think there are some problems uh, that we don't have to worry about quite as much as perhaps we worried about in the past. Uncle Mark, do you have anything? Yeah. yeah. Any good news on the horizon that we well, can talk about? Got, yeah, we'll get there. I, we, <clears throat> you know, as you guys were mentioning, it is, it is spooky season, as some people say, the heart of October. That's the word on the street, the talk around the water cooler, the buzz, as they say. <laughs> but quick before we get into an honest question, what do you guys think about Halloween? I love I've Halloween. never loved it. Ah, we have differing opinions. Okay. Uh-oh. 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 We're going to we're gonna have to separate ourselves. <laughs> you, you've never liked it at all, Doug? Even no. Even from childhood? No. <clears throat> hmm. I never. I, I, free I, candy? You, the free candy was nice, but it's like, you know, it wasn't like, you know, as, as kind of Modest as my family was, it wasn't like I couldn't afford candy other times of year. Uh, um, and I don't love the you know costume thing was always just a big drag for me. And hmm. I'm a bummer, bummer. What can I say? <laughs> but you like it, Dan. <laughs> I've always I, I've always enjoyed it. I uh, I like uh, embracing the spooky, yeah, uh, in a fun way. And I like sort of the the transgressive sort of vibe yeah. of the whole thing. I think it's a lot of fun. I like. St- I like the sexy parties. I don't know. It all just feels uh, like good. Pl- it's when grownups get to play in a way that grownups don't often do. Mm, so, like, I think that that's actually a, a lot of it for me. See, I, I loved it as a kid um, because, you know, I was this imaginative kid and didn't have a tremendous amount of outlet for it. So it was always a big deal for me. What but happened then- to the imagination? I don't know. <laughs> it's just left. I sold it oh, for great. some magic beans. But it died um, with the kid. But uh, it died with the boy. Um, but then I kind of went into the Doug sensibility of it, where like in college, I just thought it was every straight guy. You know, that was the night he put on his girlfriend's clothes and got hammered and just screamed right. all night. And I'm like, oh, fuck this shit. And then, But I, as an adult, I've kind of come full circle. I, years ago, I was working in Atlanta. And I went to my buddy's place. And autumn in Atlanta is gorgeous. Like, it's so beautiful. And, and the guy, this guy I was working on a movie with, <clears throat> was the scenic painter, so he was really capable of all this cool shit. And he had this amazing, spooky old Victorian house on a corner in this great neighborhood in Atlanta. 
and he, he went for it, right? Like the, he and his family just, it was nuts. Like oh, the I whole yard was a cemetery. There was fog everywhere. You had, and the kids, he only let them in a few at a time to walk around the wraparound porch where oh, his fun. wife was the witch at the end, right? It was all outside. And, and, but it was really spooky, spooky fun. And the kids were just lined up. Like it t- took an hour. You'd have to wait in line for an hour. And I just saw how much fucking fun they were having. Yeah, and I kind of came around and I said, you know what, this is this is actually a really cool thing. And so I, I've come full circle. And as a person who works in the imagina- imagination business, I think more imagination and creative playtime for kids is better than less. And yeah. letting children inhabit a character for a whole day is not just fun and creatively challenging, but in a way, it's kind of empathy building. <clears throat> and mm. you know, for you, as you're saying, Dan, kind of the the transgressive nature of it for for queer and non-gender gender conforming kids who are too young to have the words to say it or maybe aren't safe or, uh, to honestly express themselves in their family situation, it may be a single night of liberation after, you know, another year of living in some kind of closet. So, Well, let me, before you go on, I'll just I'll amend my, my, my harumphing a little bit. Too late. <laughs> <laughs> I don't hate Halloween for other people. I don't want it to go away or anything like that. Mm. And I love trick-or-treaters. And in the past few years, we've had a little tradition where you guys come up to my house and we watch a scary movie on Halloween and we get candy. And hunt. But the, we've only ever gotten like two or three trick-or-treaters a night. Well, and then one year we were watching the movie and we heard trick-or-treat and Dan's wife screamed so loud with excitement, I think she scared them off. <laughs> yeah, <totally. laughs> she was so excited we had trick-or-treaters. It sounded like someone was getting killed in the house. <laughs> that can happen. <laughs> And they ran away. So, but I, I love you. I, I I'm with you 100 percent on I. You know, kids getting dressed up and going out for a fun night. I I get behind that 100. percent I never loved it. Yeah. Because I am, like I said, a bit of a bummer. Yeah. See, I'm the opposite of you guys. I think the kid part is the worst part about it, and I just want them to go away so that I can have my fun. Wow, we're like all over the map with Halloween. Okay, that's cool. That's, I love it. So, but honestly, you know, I don't give a shit that it derives from a quasi-religious pagan festival. That it has precious little to do with anymore at all, right? Right. It can be magical and spooky and scary in a great way. And and what child couldn't use a little more magic in their lives? So I'm for it by gum. And that's why it's so fucking sad <clears throat> that the American habit of panic and overreaction has for so long robbed this intoxicating night of unusual permission and childhood abandon of some of its magic and transportive, transportive power. Uh, want a window into the, quote, common wisdom that Amer- American panic and overreaction to just about anything looks like around Halloween? Let me, let me quote from a piece in the October 31st, 1983 Gainesville Sun newspaper <clears throat> from a column by Abigail Van Buren, better known as advice columnist Dear Abby. Dear Abby, that's right. Yeah, who is considered a paragon of American wisdom and sensibility for reasons that will make absolutely no sense when I'm done reading this. <laughs> And didn't make sense before you started reading it either. It really, she made no sense at all. So she says, dear reader, it's Halloween again and time to remind you that somebody's child will be seriously injured or killed in a Halloween related (laughs) traffic accident. (laughs) Somebody's child will be badly maimed or fatally burned due to a flammable costume. Oh my God. (laughs) Somebody's child will become violently ill or die after eating poisoned Halloween (laughs) candy or an apple with a razor blade. Uh, somebody's child will be coaxed into an automobile and lured into a secured area, secured area, secu- uh, sorry, secluded area and sexually assaulted. Oh my God. Holy oh shit. My God. To, to make this sure that your, that child isn't yours, here are some tips to ensure the safety of your children. <laughs> oh my God. Uncle Doug, you are suddenly so much more Pollyanna about this thing than I thought. Prescient really, right? Um, use flame proof cost- costumes only. Like someone needs to tell you that. Uh, <laughs> Because masks, floppy hats, wigs, and veils often interfere with t- a child's vision, use makeup instead. Accessories such as swords, broomsticks, hatchets, wands, etc. should be made of cardboard rather than plastic, metal, or wood. Here's Sharp a little hatchet, Timmy. Now go have fun. <laughs> <laughs> Provide youngsters with flashlights to prevent falls on sidewalks and porch steps. Positively, no lighted candles should be carried. Um, so there goes your Dickens Halloween costume, I guess. <laughs> Decorate your child's costume or, and trick-or-treat bag with reflective tape to make them highly visible to motorists. Remind your child they should never enter the home of a stranger or accept rides. Adults can help by keeping their yards well-lighted. 
Parents should check all treats before allowing children to eat them. <clears throat> Very young children should never be out after dark unless accompanied by an adult. So make it a safe Halloween and come Thanksgiving, you'll have more to be thankful for. <laughs> My God. Okay. See, yeah, Uncle Doug suddenly doesn't seem like a curmudgeon at all. I know, right. Doug, Doug is on the right side of this history. So, uh, so if I let my kid go trick or treating, they're either going to be flattened by a car, accidentally incinerated, fatally po uh, poisoned, abducted by pedophiles, or impale themselves, or any of a number of combinations of all of the above. Dear Abby thinks Halloween is a single night version of the Hunger Games, apparently. So <laughs> right. have fun, kids. But if you get stab, rape, incinerated, which is hugely likely, you'll ruin Thanksgiving for everyone. <laughs> Bye. So that's a hot mess of classic American panic. Yeah. yeah. But there's one tidbit in there I want to shine a non-candle light on uh, more safely and closely. <clears throat> and that is the poisoned candy one. Yeah. This is an odious urban legend that has turned uh, a wildly fun night for children into a panic-inducing ordeal for parents, causing totally useless fugues of paranoia and hysteria since I was a lad. Countless Halloweens have been fogged by reports of diabolical strangers tainting candy with drugs, rat poison, razor blades and needles to murder or maim the children of strangers for uh, reasons, apparently. <laughs> <Yeah>. <clears throat> <clears throat> now... There are some fucked up people in the world, and there are real actual murderers who kill total strangers, even children, sure, and that's not good. Um, but it's pretty it's, deranged to assume it's a that someone... It's hard stance to take. Yeah, it's just I, not I, again, I think, I think uh, the three of us are going to disagree on that, right? <laughs> <clears throat> but it's pretty, it's pretty deranged to assume that someone up the street from you would buy bags of Halloween candy, carefully open the wrappers, poison it or stick in a needle in it, then carefully wrap it back up uh, to appear untampered with, carve up some pumpkins, turn on the porch light, and cheerfully murder every random child for the crime of yelling trick-or-treat. An insidious plot that would be easily traceable back to your front door exactly. within hours. Yes. Yeah. Speaks to something deeply fucked up in the American imagination. <clears throat> it is the most imperfect crime. <laughs> yeah, you, you're going to fry for it, right? They're going to kill you. They're going to so. get you. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> but like the rhythm, they're going to get you. <laughs> um, but like most hysterias of this nature, there are a few teensy tiny, tiny nuggets of reality that pro provide the seeds for the mighty oak of American hysteria to grow out of. So in 1959, for reasons that are not clear, a guy in California gave chocolate-covered laxatives to trick-or-treaters, many of whom ended up having a pretty shitty night, but no, that's actually no one pretty funny. <clears throat> Uh, he was still he was charged for the unlawful dispensing of drugs and a crime called an outrage against children. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> in 1964, a mean old woman who had some serious opinions about how how old trick or treaters ought to be handed out packages of steel wool, dog biscuits and very clearly marked ant poison oh. to older kids whom she told they were gag treats in order to scold them for participating in the holiday. I see. That blew up into a huge news story about poison candy and dead children, but no one died or was even hurt by her crabby little stunt. <clears throat> even so, she was charged with endangering children. Yeah, it's that's not a cool thing to do. <clears throat> no, it's a shitty thing to do. Um, like, don't just don't participate in Halloween. Like, just yeah, turn your, your porch light, light off. And, yeah. yeah. Um, but he, here are the two stories that really blew the the poison candy panic up. In 1970, a five-year-old boy in Detroit named Kevin Toston was reported to have died after eating some of his trick-or-treat hall. An investigation uh, was immediately launched and com community panic ensued. Everybody, everybody's hair was on fire. His family provided the police with several weirdly tampered with pieces of candy that were tainted with heroin. Hmm. Um, their story fell apart pretty quickly, though, as they soon admitted to the fact that the boy had found his uncle's heroin stash mistook it for candy and consumed a massive fatal dose. Oh, oh, shit. Uh, and the frantic family was trying to cover for the uncle when they tried to fake the evidence of more tainted candy. Shitty, right. awful, a dead kid, but no case of strangers handing out poison candy to random children. Moral of the story, <clears throat> never trust an uncle. Well, <laughs> yeah, exactly. But Uncles. also, like, uh, people don't just give away their heroin. That's yeah. not... That's, That's, you can kind of count on heroin users exactly. to keep that. 
If heroin yeah. users are known for one thing, it's not giving away heroin. Yeah, it, a peanut butter cup is cheaper than a fix, so you're not getting their heroin. So, <clears throat> um, the other story is even more awful. In 1974, an eight year old boy in Texas named Timothy O'Brien ended up dying after apparently consuming a poisoned pixie stick. Uh, once again, the full force of the police was brought to bear. <clears throat> Community panic led to a national panic. It was all over the news. You can imagine. I remember. What, what year was that? 74. <clears throat> I don't I, think you I, remember it, 74. No. I don't, but I do remember <laughs> like there was a, I'm sure we'll get there, but a marked fear of pixie sticks when I was a kid. Well, this might have been the, the yeah. source of that. So um, events surrounding the night of the poisoning began to seem very peculiar, however. Uh, while out with several neighborhood kids and other parents, Timothy's father, Ronald O'Brien, dashed ahead to a house that did not appear to be participating in the holiday. Then he came back down off the porch with a handful of pixie sticks. The other parents thought it was odd that he had trick-or-treated without the kids, like an adult just knocking on the door by himself. <laughs> and they hadn't seen the door of the house open, but he said they had just opened it a crack and handed them, uh, handed them out to him. The police then discovered that Ronald had recently taken out life insurance policies on both of his children. Oh, my God. No way. <laughs> Even increasing them the day before Halloween, much to the discomfort of the very weirded out insurance agent who was like, yeah, people don't normally do this, you know. Yeah, this is this is not a... <laughs> this a, is what's a called thing. a red flag in the yeah. industry. <laughs> it was also discovered that the pixie sticks he gave the other children had been opened and closed back up with a staple. A staple? <laughs> yeah. Not exactly wow. how pixie stick is typically how they come out of the package, right? <laughs> so it turns out Ronald O'Brien was distressed about being in debt and decided that collecting the life insurance policies he'd taken out on his own preteen children was his ticket to financial freedom. Oh my God. He even called the insurance company the very next morning to try and collect after his son died. Wow. He That's hoped the it. other kids uh, he gave the poison to would also die in order to cover his tracks. So that's fucked up. Oh my god! For those of you who don't know what a pixie stick is, we it, it's just it's like a paper straw with basically just granulated sugar. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's kind of poison already. It's yeah. yeah it is li literally cocaine for kids. Yeah, but much slower acting than the cyanide that he put. In. And the amount of cyanide he put in these would kill like four adults. That is but incredible. also, I, I I should mention I. Uh, even though it is cocaine for kids, don't snort it. I know from experience that is not pleasant. <laughs> exactly. Got, there's something called a uh, caramel nose that is <laughs> not often seen in emergency rooms. So all the doctors are going to come check it out when the case shows up. It's like a big deal. It's a big deal. They look forward to it on Halloween. So, so the, prick, the press nicknamed uh, O'Brien the Candy Man after the hit song Sammy Davis Jr. recorded in 1972 <clears throat> after it was featured in Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory in 1971. Oh so that adds a sweet twist to this nightmare saga. Uh, the jury in his case took all of 46 minutes to convict him with one count of murder and four of attempted murder. For his crimes, the state of Texas executed the Candyman in 1984. A terrible, horrible, no good story. But again, not strangers trying to poison random children. <clears throat> Remember, if you get raped, abducted, assaulted, or murdered in the United States, statistics overwhelming, overwhelmingly show it was by someone you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was not helpful to the explosion of this sinister canard that it was happening concurrently uh, concurrently with and likely because of the satanic panic, right. another American hysteria happening at the same time, which we discussed in episode 23. So stories of candy poisoning could trace the motivation of the perpetrators, and I'm saying quote perpetrators, to fables of widespread child sacrifice and ritual abuse that were apparently raging in every community from coast to coast. Uh, the very Christian and very demented illustrator Jack Chick, who we'll, we need to talk about another time, yes. um, added fuel to the fire by making one of his famous Chick tracks <clears throat> depicting a black mass where witches were asking Satan to bless their poisons, their needles, razor blades, and candies so they might deliver him the maximum number of child sacrifices on his special day. Ugh. And a stupidly credulous, as both local and national news media were about everything related to the satanic panic, it just became common wisdom, accepted yeah. fact that your children were very likely the target of a sadistic child murderer living somewhere within a few blocks of your house. By, by 1985, 60% of Americans were terrified of letting their children eat their well-earned sugary booty. Uh, a guy named Joel but, Best. But, but I must say, for all the wrong reasons. Yeah. They, yeah. they should have been concerned. <laughs> yeah. But for other reasons. 
well, you know, kind of diabetes is as American as apple pie, right? So, um, so Joel Best, a professor of sociology and criminal justice at the University of Delaware, is the world's leading expert on Halloween candy poisoning and tampering legends. Oh, no. It's, it's actually his life's work. Um, this particular thing. So he's, he spent years tracking down every single report of poisoned goodies. And other than the sad circumstances I've mentioned above, there's absolutely no truth to any of the hundreds of panics, urban myths, and credulous local news stories. Wow. Yet to this day, news outlets warn of the dangers of poison candy and razor blades and apples. Uh, and by the way, if you're handing out apples on Halloween, even without Ooh. razor blades, you're a monster <laughs> and to be avoided. Stop Ooh. doing that. There's no apples. Texas should give you the chair for that. So Ooh, trying to keep kids healthy. Boo. <laughs> give you, yeah. you can have an apple any other fucking day. Yeah. Um, some hospitals and clinics will still x-ray your candy to check for needles and shit. Oh, I know. Crazy. It's amazing. Yeah. Churches and other groups have long organized uh, what's called trunk or treat events. Yeah. yeah. We're, we're basically all the same people whose porches you would have visited park in the church parking lot for the added safety feature of having candy distributed from the trunks of idling cars. <laughs> so <clears throat> that's much more fun, you guys. It sets a good precedent for the child, too. Oh. They learned that getting yeah. stuff that, out of the trunk of a car is, is a safe and healthy way of doing things. <laughs> And so, spare a thought for the for the murderer pedophile down the road, like looking down the street at the parking lot, going, "Ah, if they I'm foiled wrong, me, they foiled me." Yeah, with his bowl full of needles back at home. <laughs> um, and look, given the political nightmare we're currently going through in this country, I'm as suspicious of about forty percent of my neighbors as the next guy. <laughs> but Halloween is also a lot of fun as a community event. The people with their porch lights on love to see the kids in their costumes and help yeah. contribute to the wonder and mischief and magic of a special childhood event. They bought candy to give it to your children for free, not to murder them with it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Have a tiny bit more fucking faith in humanity, which is weird for me to say. But yeah, <clears throat> right. obviously, dis despite Dear Abby thinking she needs to remind us not to let our children set themselves on fire, most parents do everything they can to make Halloween safe and fun for their kids. Uh, though this year, obviously, is going to be a weird one for sure. And, yeah. and you know, sure, take a look in the bag if you're nervous. But taking candy to get x-rayed going to the, quote, safe trunk or treats is giving into a lie about events that never happened. Just another hysterical moral, moral panic that has seized our weird American neck hairs from the Salem witch trials to the Muslim ban. Mm -hmm. There's plenty to be scared about in the world right now, like the very air we breathe is filled with murder germs. A paleo-fascist Supreme Court nominee is looking ready to legislate us back to pre-Deuteronomy. <laughs> and a steroid-fueled Trump doing the tongue-out Epstein dance at his rally that I cannot unsee. <laughs> so be afraid of that shit, but not the candy for fuck's sake. So Yeah, I am 100% on record as being so thoroughly against the trunk or treat thing. Not just because, you know, it's it ruins the 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 fun of like the, the sort of scavenger hunt nature of the yeah. of trick or treating but also because like you as a kid you finally have motivation to actually interact with people <clears throat> I completely that aren't in your you. church yeah. that aren't in you know you don't know who they are and you go to their house and they give you something nice and it's like uh, there's something beautiful ab about the house to house thing. It's I a community thing. It's like a com it's like a beautiful kind of building community in this one kind of funky little way, and I think it's cool. And I think yeah. the trunk or treat. I I completely agree with you, Uncle Danik. I think the trunk or treat is actually quite racist because it it's not you know you're not call you're like going to all of your neighbors and saying let's all go do this thing. You're going to your community like your your church group. Um, it, one of the, my, the you know, of the Halloween I hated, one of the favorite things was that you'd get candy from like Latino families. It was something you'd never seen before. Yeah. yeah. You know, it was like a different kind of candy. It was really cool. And yeah. you wouldn't, you'd get and There's to always go, the woman who gives you like the full size candy bar and you're like, I'm never fucking forgetting her. Yeah, yeah. exactly. But it's those like, I people. I will cry at her know, funeral. If you're, you're, if you're not part of that church group or whatever group it is, you're not going to the trunk or treat. Right. So you're not exposing your kids to to the people who live around them. I completely agree. Yeah. Yeah. So and but it's I all and again all that is based on bullshit. It's but based I remember, on lie. Uncle Mark, when we were kids and all of us, that was a constant refrain around Halloween. Yeah. Don't oh, eat yeah. your candy till you get home. You know, uh, 
I remember that very clearly. And, Bre- and break all the candy bars in half before you eat them. Yep. And yeah. it's still a thing. That's so yeah. crazy. Yep. Uh. So there it is. Get out there. Get some candy. And, uh, you know, if you're going to poison somebody, do it another night of the year. Don't be a dick about it. Well, well again, and also, also, you know, follow in the tradition and poison someone you love. That's right. <laughs> well, exactly. And, about, and, and again, about the trunk or treats, <clears throat> if, if U.S. crime statistics tell us anything, it, it's don't trust people in your church. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Exactly. So you're better off with strangers. Go get well, some candy. Well, remember, though, this year, you, I mean, A, you should be concerned that your child is eating a pillowcase full of candy in one night. That's a bad. Boo. But Boo also, you. you know, during the pandemic, every candy that you get from a stranger is poisoned. Yeah. So, you know, maybe not this year, I guess. Sorry, oh, kids. You're back to curmudgeonly. I don't, I, I, I don't like curmudgeon, Doug. I never left. Do you know what we're going to do? We're going to put a sign on the door that says, say trick or treat, step back 10 feet. And I'll put a little piece, uh, piece of tape on the sidewalk in front of our house, and we'll toss your treat to you. <laughs> Say trick or treat, step back 10 feet, give me something good to eat. <laughs> yeah, there you go. We'll all be safe. All righty. All right. Okay. Bye. Well, Uncle Mark. Hello. It is uh, a particular time of year, and, mm. uh, you know... Halloween is in the air, and part of that brew is the witches. Part of that brew is brujaria. Ooh, see, si? yeah, what? muy bien. Well, and oh. and so, so you're you're talking in funny talk. Yes. That's right. Yeah, so speak American, goddamn it. <laughs> That's right. It's Halloween. You speak American, <laughs> just like Jesus done. <laughs> <laughs> so, Uncle Dan, I think you have, you know. Uh, which witch to talk about which us yes yes it is october and that means it's fall here anyway obviously in australia it's april so (laughs) yes i do want to talk about witches it being the witching time of year now to be clear i'm not going to talk about 20th and 21st century quote unquote witches Mm. Uh, for that cauldron of steaming poo you can feel free to listen to my bit on wicca from episode 128. Mm. Uh, you may be saying to yourself, I don't remember a segment on Wicca, but that's just because that episode ended with Uncle Mark talking about the Ant Hill Kids, and we were also ta- traumatized <laughs> oh with my God. the entire episode. I forgot after. that. <laughs> so, Sorry, everybody. <laughs> I did, in fact, do that, so you can go and listen to it and just stop before the end. Yeah, yeah please, please stop before the last segment. <laughs> But no, the witches I want to talk about are the old school witches, the sorceresses, the diviners, the casters of spells, and one very special witch who foretold the future with astounding accuracy. (laughs) Right? My theremin ran out of air. (laughs) (laughs) That'll happen. It's a Scottish theremin. Yeah, I didn't realize that the theremin was a wind instrument. (laughs) Oh, boy. Well, okay. So the concept of witchcraft goes back a long way. And I'm talking ancient Egypt here. I'm talking Babylonia here. I'm talking Mm. thousands of years ago. As a matter of fact, part of an Akkadian witchcraft ritual is literally chiseled in stone in the Code of Hammurabi. Mm. Don't at me about the pronunciation. Uh, Which is a Babylonian text from about 2000 BCE. The Code of Hammurabi uh, deals a lot in sort of social issues, how contracts should work, how much to pay an ox or a surgeon, and if somebody casts a spell on somebody else, how to tell if it was right for that person to have done that. Wait, you have to pay the ox? The driver. Oh, sorry. (laughs) Ox driver. Oh, okay, gotcha. Uh, So anyway, here's a. this is a quote from that Code of Hammurabi. Quote, if a man has, a, has put a spell upon another man and it is not justified, he upon whom the spell is laid <coughs> shall go to the holy river. Into the holy river shall he plunge. If the holy river overcome him and he is drowned, the man who put the spell on him shall take possession of his house. <laughs> if the holy river declares him innocent and he remains unharmed, the man who laid the spell shall be put to death. He that plunged into the river shall take possession of the house uh, of him who laid the spell upon him. Pretty foolproof when you think about it. Yeah, I'm just glad I don't live in ancient anywhere. (laughs) And what else floats? 
a duck. <laughs> oh, we'll get to the duck. All right, all right. Yeah, yeah. We're not there yet. Uh, but this was a, uh, a pretty good uh, method of determining things, unless you don't believe that rivers know what they're doing. Yeah, I mean, if the rivers don't know what's up, then suddenly witchcraft becomes a very dangerous game. <laughs> anyway, uh, this passage is interesting because it makes clear that the ancient Mesopotamians were idiots <laughs> and didn't know that when it comes to witchcraft, you're supposed to be throwing that side eye at the ladies. Come on, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's also fascinating to note that the problem Hammurabi had with witchcraft wasn't if it was good or bad in and of itself, but rather uh, if it des was deserved or not. If right. it was misapplied. Yeah. Uh, so witchery features heavily in the Bible. We've talked about that. Mm -hmm. uh, it's commonly associated with evil and the devil. <clears throat> Throughout the bad book, witches are condemned and sentenced to die for their sin. Uh, except the part where Saul has the witch of Endor summon the spirit of uh, uh, the dead spirit of Samuel. That witch is cool, I guess. But <laughs> as for the rest of them, well, Exodus is pretty unambiguous when it says, Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. And since so society still hasn't figured out how utterly nonsensical that book is, accusations of evil witchcraft continue to plague society to this day. Yeah. Interestingly, historically, there was a long period in Christianity where witchcraft wasn't taken seriously. Hmm. The 20th century, you ask? Foolishly? <laughs> no! <laughs> obviously not! Accusations of witchcraft happen all over the world. Mostly women still get attacked for this shit. No, shockingly, the time I'm talking about is actually the so-called Dark Ages. Really? For centuries, the church was actually, brace yourselves, kind of reasonable about the idea. As a matter of fact, somewhere around the year 900, the church released Canon Episcopi. Episcopi. Uh, Episcopi. Who knows? Yeah. Which was a passage of church law that dealt with folk beliefs uh, and what the church thought of them. Now, if you had asked me what the Christian take on witches in the year 900 was, I would have been positive that they were terrified of shit of them and probably burned every 20th woman in every village just to be on the exactly, safe side. Exactly. Yeah, I would have totally said the same thing. <clears throat> but that's not the case. Huh. In Canon Episcopi, uh, it doesn't even believe in witchcraft. It dismisses the idea as a fabrication. And women who called themselves witches, or in this case claimed to be followers of the pagan goddess Diana, weren't really magical. They had just been deceived by the devil into believing that they were magical. Mm. That's the church's whole take. The church's whole take on them was that Satan had taken possession of their minds, and that was bad. And they should probably be kicked out of the town before they trick anybody else into their dumb beliefs but that they were harmless when it came to magic. Huh. So there wasn't there was satanic uh, possession and shit, but there wasn't witchcraft. That's right. Huh. There was there were demons and uh, and heretics were of course burned at the stake or whatever, but All day. there wasn't such thing as like people who actually had witchy powers. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was the word on witches in Europe for actually a long time. But you know the church, there's no reasonable position that they can't untake. That's right. By the 15th century, people were positively itching to believe in scary magic ladies. Uh, that notion bubbled through the land until the 1480s when a particularly uptight German clergyman named Heinrich Kramer got his panties in a twist about some local young women. Uh, he attempted to try them for witchcraft, taking a particular interest, and this is always a good sign, in the sexual pro proclivities of one of them. Mm -hmm. Uh, but, but fortunately, the trial was a total bust and the women were allowed to stay in town. Hmm. Heinrich, on the other hand, wasn't so lucky. The local bishop was so disturbed by the whole affair that he kicked Heinrich out, calling him senile and crazy. So, another point for reason. Hooray! Don't <laughs> get used to it. Uh, after his exile, Brother Kramer decided to write a treatise on witchcraft called Malleus Maleficarum, which sounds like a it, it sounds like the spell that uh, that you know uh, J.K. Rowling tries to cast to uh, to stop trans women <laughs> to say that trans existing. women don't exist. <laughs> oh. Yeah, yeah. 
Uh, anyway, it translates something to something like the hammer of witches. <clears throat> In it, he outlines exactly how evil the witches are. He discusses at length how to tell if he or she is a witch. Yes, it was mostly women, but sometimes you meet a guy who looks at you funny, you know? <laughs> now, it turns out that even though there was a perfectly scientific method available for establishing witchery involving scales and a duck, <laughs> our boy Heinrich needed to be more certain uh, than even floating weight comparisons were capable of. So, he suggested a far more reasonable way to sniff out a witch. It's simple when you think about it. <laughs> it's almost funny that it took this long to figure it out. You just torture and lie to them until, the, until she confesses. Oh. Yeah. Doy. Doy. You know what I'm saying? Unless you think that uh, that's just sort of standard Inquisition stuff, apparently it wasn't. Hmm. Apparently, the top theologians of the Inquisition condemned it as being unethical and illegal. I repeat. What? The Inquisition <laughs> what thought doing? that Malleus Maleficarum went too far. Oh, well, nobody, nobody expected that. <laughs> yeah. Boom. Exactly. So, uh, Heinrich's book gained little traction in the church, which is awesome. Uh, the problem is that books stick around. <laughs> Malleus Maleficarum had lots of editions, uh, and once the printing press got up and running, it really got out there. Huh. Eventually, it fell into the hands of local magistrates all over Europe, and it was them and not the church that really ran with the idea leading to the widespread killing of thousands of obviously innocent women. I, if I've said it once, I've said it a thousand times. The printing press was a bad idea. Right? <laughs> it's so clear. So far, you Doug, you've it. come out against Halloween and the printing press <laughs> on this show. Just in one fucking episode. I am <laughs> consistent. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All things are bad. He's our own Dougie Downer. <laughs> uh, but... I, here's the thing. I don't want to talk generally. I want to tell talk about one particular witch, the proto-witch, the witch who became the pattern for all subsequent witches. Hmm. Without, without knowing it, this is the woman that you imagine when someone around Halloween says the word witch. Hmm. Hmm. This is Ursula Soothtel, better, better known as Mother Shipton. Ur now, Ursula Soothtel? Sooth tell, because she told Sooth. That is the name. coolest name yeah. ever in history. Yes, indeed. <laughs> yeah. uh, and, and not everyone calls her that. Mm. Some some say Ursula South Southiel, hmm. or or but uh, but yes, this was, I just chose the ones that I liked awesome as I name. did yeah. with the story uh, because they're pl they're competing stories. So yeah, I'm gonna choose, go with the one that I like best, and you can ch I challenge you to prove me wrong. Anyway, uh, Ursula was born in a cave in Yorkshire, England, around 1488, uh, which was one year after that naughty Heinrich wrote his little his dirty little book. Unlucky for her, probably. Uh, it turns out fine. But yeah. being being uh, born she, in the 1400s was the definition of bad luck for everyone. Yeah. I listen. I'm living through 2020. I them bitches got nothing. On <laughs> yeah. Me. Fuck you, Inquisition people. Uh. So. <clears throat> Uh, she was the daughter of one Agatha Soothtel and a handsome devil known as... Oh, no, wait. He was just the devil. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, so, you know, there, that'll happen. Uh, Ursula was, by all accounts, a precocious little girl, always getting into mischief, which you might expect from the Classic. literal spawn of Satan. <laughs> anyway, she grew up and married a carpenter named Shipton, which is unfortunate because it's the name Soothtel was, you know... Appropriate. Yeah. Uh, no one knows how she charmed Mr. Shipton into marriage, but folks theorized that it had to do with some sort of magic, either enchanting him to love her or magically making herself rich. Uh, what we do know is that it wasn't through her gorgeous appearance because she was hideous. <laughs> really? Oh, the big nose <clears throat> crooked down with pimples, warts, and carbuncles all over. And in an and also in an assortment of disgusting colors, mm. uh, a strange upturned chin. Like I say, she's the witch. Oh. Well, is there an illustration of her you found? Or? There are several illustrations oh, wow. of her. Look around. Yeah, but I mean, basically, it's just if you imagine witch, that's her. Huh. But 
We don't remember her for her looks. The reason Mother Shipton is famous is because she was a prophetess, a soothsayer of epic proportions. And none of this vague could apply to anything Nostradamus bullshit. She was specific, relatively. Hmm. So, so much so that she got herself in hot water with none other than King Henry VIII himself. Oh, boy. Yeah, you, <laughs> you, you, if you're a woman, you do not want to cross that man's yeah, path. One guy yeah. you don't want to be on the wrong side of the bed with. Yeah. No, yeah, exactly. After putting down a rebellion, old Hank had demanded a bunch of traitors be brought to him, including, quote, that witch of York. So uh, she pissed off so many people in Henry's court that Cardinal Wolsey, Henry's close advisor, had a dust up with her. He was also the Archbishop of York, though he had never actually been there himself. He went and sent some men before him to question the witch. She told the men that Wolsey would see York, but never actually set foot there. Mm. Sure enough, Wolsey climbed a nearby tower uh, on his way, from which he was able to see the city, but was recalled to London to answer charges of treason. Oh. He died on the way home. Boom! First prophecy fulfilled. <laughs> Other prophecies about nobles uh, of, of the time also came true. Famous dudes losing their heads, the rise of Queen Elizabeth, the rise of King James, the fire of London. All of these were pre predicted and in verse, no less. But you ain't seen nothing yet. <laughs> She didn't just make predictions about her time. She saw way into the future. Check out these snippets and to see if they don't blow your damned mind. Quote! Carriages without horses shall go, and accidents fill the world with woe. <laughs> Around the world, thoughts shall fly in the twinkling of an eye. Huh? Hmm? Here we go. Here's some more. Uh, through hills men shall ride, and no horse be at his side. Well, Underwater men shall walk, shall ride, shall sleep, shall talk. Are these for real? You, re you re There's more. In the air men shall be seen, in white, in black, in green. I'm not sure what the colors have to do with anything, but <laughs> men are flying. Well, you have to wonder how much of her prophesying was contaminated by the need to rhyme yeah <laughs> yeah know? exactly just, yeah she really she really got herself into, into into some tight spots yeah uh fortunately she didn't she clearly didn't feel the need for the verse to be perfect yeah you try right. find, finding something that rhymes with 5g network come on <laughs> yeah exactly uh here's another one iron in the water shall float as easily as a wooden boat mm. and if that isn't enough for you there's the coup de gras the icing on the cake. The bit that literally caused panic. After all of those amazing predictions came true, this one caused people to sell their stuff and hide in the forest that is truth. Here we go. The world to an end shall come in 1881. <laughs> <laughs> well, they can't all be winners. Yeah. Uh, and it, it may have been a little hysterical of folks to have panicked like that, considering the fact that the guy who sold them the book of Mother Shipton's predictions also admitted to have written them, uh, to having written them. Oh, really? Okay. That's right. All of those amazing prophecies about the modern world were written as a hoax well after they had happened. In 1873, Charles Hendley confessed to having made it all up. Oh, thank God. You guys almost <laughs> lost an uncle there. Right? <laughs> Uh, and considering that the uh, the end of the world was supposed to happen in 81, that gave ample time for people to stop believing in it. But <laughs> you know how people are. Why give up a good woo just because you know for a fact that it's bullshit? God well, damn. I just I want to push back a little bit because I just looked it up. And it turns out that James Garfield was assassinated in 1881. Oh. Well, so, and that so, was the end of the world? Well, for him. For him. <laughs> It was. It's true. It was the end of the world for a lot of people. Yeah, really. probably. Uh, so there you go. Of course, Henley was just one in a long line of people who had written prophecies after the fact and attributed them to Miss Ursula. Uh, it turns out that, there, that it's a lot easier to be accurate in your prognostications if you do them backwards. 
That's not to say that it's super easy. For example, in some of the really early stuff, the mother shipped in predi predictions uh, published only decades and not centuries after her death, were, uh, there were predictions about, quote, Lord Percy, but then got things wrong, indicating that it was actually about a different Lord Percy. <laughs> that sort of thing. Gotcha. Uh, Mother Shipton is the stuff of legends. You can still visit the grave where she, or sorry, not the grave, the cave where she supposedly was born outside of York. It's been so popular as a point of interest for so long that they call themselves the oldest tourist tourist attraction in England. Wow. <laughs> That's a pretty heavy claim for yeah. a country with as much history as, as England. With it, uh, such an assortment of henges. I was about to yes, say. Yes, indeed. <laughs> yeah. You're various and sundry. Uh, and it's made all the more interesting by the fact that Mother Shipton almost certainly was not born there. As a matter of fact, it's entirely possible that no such person ever existed. Oh. Uh, Henry VIII's letter did mention a witch of York, uh, but nobody actually knows who that was referring to, so... There you go. Mother Shipton appeared in countless books. She's appeared in plays, pantomimes. There's even a, mo a moth named after her oh. because of the splotches on its wings look like uh, her imagined crone face in profile. Huh. I was, I was thinking this was going to end terribly with some poor old woman being burned to death, but it turns out there was nothing to burn. There was nothing there to burn. Wow. Uh, it seems likely that this was just uh, a nice and somewhat wise. There may have been, uh, you know, a somewhat wise woman who people went to for advice and her legend sort of grew out of control. Yeah. And people <clears throat> wanted to believe magic existed. So they just made shit up. Or, or it's a composite character or something like that. Yes, so. exactly. Or maybe she was just entirely fake all along. But then again, the greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world he didn't exist. <laughs> it's true. And like that, poof, she was gone. <laughs> well, I looked up her picture, and she is the classic witch. Yep. Yep, she's the very, very classic witch. And, and as yep. you were saying, Europe, I'm surprised that Europe went through a, <laughs> hey, let's not burn witches phase for a while, because... Yeah, it was, <clears throat> it was just a witches aren't real phase, which is uh, something we should really get back to. We should really look into that. Yeah. I don't... Often recommend, uh, you know, the attitudes of the Dark Ages. But that one's one that's worth looking, re reinvesting in. Yeah, we talked about uh, Father Grandier and the Witches of Loudon a uh, mm. few episodes back. And that was in the 1630s. So, you know, yeah. as, this, as the 17th century Enlightenment was kind of dawning across the rest of Europe, the church was still burning up witches. Yeah, they really, they really uh, got went after that with gusto sort yeah. of after after the uh, this time of of of, of the of history it became well, all know, the rage it's like yeah. bell bottoms you know it's yeah. things just this these these fads just keep coming back and going away so i get yeah. it i get it's it fun. well cool well let's uh let's fly on out of here yeah dress like a witch everybody Gentlemen, uh, hello uh, again, and and welcome to the part of the show where we talk about the people that are uh, supporting us. Yes, yeah. where we welcome the money changers into the temple. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. We we only turn over the uh, we only turn over the tables to find more money. That's right. Uh, we only turn we only turn over the Bitcoin tables. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So uh, all of you guys listening at home. Uh, a lot of you are very generous and want to give us your money, and we don't understand why, but we love it, and it's our favorite thing. So we got a lot of thanking to do today, fellas, so gear up. You ready? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so thanks first to Kat and Michael, uh, and now it's time to throw out uh, some, some saints. We Ooh. got some saints. So, Uncle Doug, <clears throat> oh boy. Uh, give a saint to Chris. Well, I have been watching a lot of Simpsons reruns lately, so I'm sorry, Chris. Uh, your saint is uh, Saint Pyromancer, the breakdancer of uh, <laughs> Walla Walla, Washington. Ah. Um, he's the patron saint of New Billboard Day, which by default makes him the patron saint of English muffins, uh, barbecue sauce applied directly to still living cows, oh. and of course, inedible clown colleges. 
So <laughs> inedible, <laughs> inedible clown colleges. Okay. Yeah. The people who get this reference love this reference. I'm telling okay. you, Taru, that's for you. Yeah. Oh Con- wow. Congratulations. Excellent. Yeah. There you go, uh, buddy. And it wasn't for Taru. It was for Chris. Of well course, done, Chris. Chris. Is, that's your saint. Uh, Uncle Mark, mm. I'm going to give you. Uh, you need to do a saint for Ellie. Uh, Ellie. Yes. Ellie. Ellie, you. Oh, my gosh. This I didn't think I, this was in the rotation, but here we go. You get St. Uh, Mandible of um, Tibiana, and uh, <laughs> the, uh, they are the patron saint of uh, unisex lounge and cabana apparel, um, uh, Neapolitan iced creams, uh, and, of course... Uh, most obviously, uh, uh, poetry about the Seven Gorges Dam in China. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. I love oh, it. Oh, Seven Gorges Dam. <laughs> you are it's so mostly beautiful. Mostly limericks. Strangely. You are so huge. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> All right. And then I've got to give a saint to, uh, uh, we have, this is a person who has been a, uh, a patron of ours, but has upped their game. So... Authentic frontier gibberish. Uh, your your patron saint is uh, in and it appropriately is Yosemite Bob, patron saint of uh, let's see of of over uh, comically oversized pistols of uh, also comically oversized uh, headwear <laughs> and of uh, the the word tarnation. <laughs> and it can also be pronounced Yosemite, by the yes, way. Yes, exactly. That's <laughs> yeah. right. So, yeah. so that's good. Yeah. And then, uh, uh, Uncle Mark, you, there's one more that I can't remember that you're going to have to give to Uncle Doug to, Holy to do. Holy shit. Oh, uh, Doug, this and, and this major apologies to this patron because, again, Patreon, why did you make it so hard to tell when people fucking... It's just it's crazy. So, so this is someone we've owed a saint to for a little bit of time. This is Dylan, uh, who, by the way said in a note to remind us that Doug is his favorite uncle, so ha! Dylan is on my shit list. But Uncle right. Doug, maybe you are a more appropriate insainter for oh boy. The, our dear friend Dylan. Dylan, you're putting me on the spot here, but because you love me, I love you back. And and from now on, listeners, no one has to say that Uncle Doug is the favorite uncle. We'll just assume it. <laughs> um, so, uh, Dylan, your, your saint is uh, Saint Star Scream, the squishy of <laughs> Omaha. Mm. She is the patron saint of uh, blank album co- album covers, like the mm. Beatles' Wy- White Album or uh, Spinal, Spinal Tap, Tap Smell the Glove. Oh, Smell the Glove, yeah. Yeah. Um, a hologram- she's also the patron saint of holograms of dead rappers and uh, <laughs> landlocked seabirds. Nice. <laughs> there you go. I Which are it. the patron saints of Utah, by the way. That's yes, right. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, good. Well, uh, all of these people have generously decided to give of their talents uh, in the sense of money. And we sure appreciate it. If you want to do the same, you, dear listener, can go to howtoheretic.com, click on the support us thing. It's so easy. It's It doesn't cost much. You get to decide how much you want to give us. It can be anything. It can be $1 an episode. It can be $1,000 an episode. Uh, and the more you give, obviously, the better a person yeah, you are. Yeah, the president's a billion dollars in debt. Get, you know, have some courage. Get close to that. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, to, yeah. We usually advise people on this show to be like the president. Yes. <laughs> <clears throat> so if you can't do that, go ahead and uh, give us five stars. Uh, three is not good. If you think we're a three star show, give us five stars. That's how that works. Yeah. And uh, we sure do appreciate all of you. Let's move on. Woohoo. <laughs> Well, Uncle Dan. Hello. Um, I. What's great about this moment in time right now is... Oh, there's something? Uh, I mean, there's so many things. Where do you want me to start? But I'm where, excited. What I was going to say is public trust in, in government and our institutions has never been higher. Oh, yeah. You <laughs> can't... Every, every politician has a, a, an approval rating... Well above 80. Well, yeah. well above the zero it ought to be. So, right. Uh, yeah, exactly. Well, it's a good time of year, Mark. The, the murder hornets hibernate. So there's <laughs> that. Oh, do they? I don't know. That's, that's they, just so they get much stronger. 
Um, yeah, they sleep in forest fires and become turbocharged. So, um, so Doug, why don't you tell us about uh, trust in, in politicians right now? Well, I'd love to. Uh, dear uncles, we are in the final days of what will be, <clears throat> at the very best, one of the most disastrous, fraught, and violent elections in our history. And at worst, the last election in the American experiment. <laughs> lest, lest anyone out there think I'm being hyperbolic, I present to you the news. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm, well, of course, I, talk- I, I think you may be being hyperbolic because there were elections in Saddam's Iraq. He was just the only person on the ballot. That's yeah. true. Yeah. And, yeah, there yeah. are lots of places that have elections. It's just, it's yeah. just if they're free and fair, that's the question. The ballot Truly. box is just a shredder. That's right. Yeah. So <laughs> as you guys point out, I'm actually talking about the American election. And I know we have a lot of listeners from many other countries, but I have to tell you, our international friends, there is nary a molecule of oxygen left to think about anybody else right now. Yes, sorry. Um, This election is so encompassing and, you know, I don't think I think about anything else. Um, Doug, the friends I correspond (laughs) with in foreign countries, especially Canada, are just as engrossed as we are. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, How how could anyone pay attention to anything else when... That man has his finger on America's nuclear arsenal. I mean, this button. joke is in poor taste right now, but when America catches a cold, the world gets sick, right? Yeah. Very poor taste. Yeah. <laughs> Too soon. There are some pretty obvious differences between the two presidential candidates and between the candidates for all the elected positions that will be decided in this election. However, there is one thing that basically unites nearly all of them. And as far as I could find, uh, just by looking, you know, kind of a tertiary look, all of them. And that's that all of them are profession are, are professed people of faith. Mm-hmm. Now, I know that way, some way down ballot candidates are professed atheists. I couldn't find any in this election cycle. I know they're there. Well, uh, Derek Kitchen, but he's not on the ballot. Is he this year? No, not this year, no. Yeah. Um, so for every elected position in this country, from dog catcher to president, one is required to profess their faith loudly and often. In fact, the further up the ballot you go, the more religious the candidate has to pretend to be, at least. If you want to be a congressperson, senator, or president, you must have B-roll of yourself entering or leaving a church, or at least suspending constitutional rights to shamble across the street to awkwardly hold up a Bible upside down in front of one. Yeah, Let's- I find that, that tear gas is actually pretty useful for all church-going occasions, so. I, I, if I've said it once, I've said it a thousand times, tear gas has a million uses. Yeah, as, as <laughs> somebody said to, you know, he, he, he attacked peaceful protesters with federal troops to hold up a book he doesn't read in front of a church he doesn't attend. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> so let's start with at the top of the ballot, so to speak, and work our way down. To be president of the United States, according to the Constitution, one need only be a naturally born citizen and be 35 years old. As far as qualifications go, that's it. You don't mm-hmm. need to be an expert on anything. You don't, have, you don't need to be smart. You don't even have to win the most votes. Thank you very much, Electoral College. Yeah. So you can be a warmonger, a crook, a dope, a racist, a bigot, a misogynist, a rank idiot. And I'm not even talking about Donald Trump. Yeah. He has, I mean, these are all previous presidents we've had. Yeah. He has, you know, Trump has in so many ways scrambled our politics, not least in the list of things one can be and still be president. Now you can add to that list openly bragging about sexual assault, openly pining for your adult daughter, calling for violence against your political opponents, refusing for a, a peaceful transfer of power, etc. Mm. There are there are however still a few factors that as of now absolutely disqualify a person from being president of the United States, being a woman, being an out member of the LGBTQ community, and being an admitted atheist. And it's the former I want to talk about today. But before we get there, uh, we should at least spend a moment on the latter two. We can attribute the fact that a woman has never been president to a deep-seated and not-so-secret misogyny that courses through this country. And we we can attribute the fact that, although we have certainly had a gay president, I'm looking at you, James K. Polk, we have never had one that admitted to it. To a deep-seated and not-so-secret bigotry that courses through our country. Where, where, it, are you serious? Polk is a gay, was secretly no, gay? I just randomly threw a <laughs> dart. Like, wait, hold no, on a second. But, but actually, there are a couple of guys who are, who are likely, uh, yeah. and I think Buchanan is one of them. Yeah, you guys can have him. Yes, um, and, the, and, and there was also the discussion about Abe Lincoln and his very special roommate. Right. Right. Yeah. So having had only one president of color does little to redeem our national reputation based on the fact that We've only had one, 
Yeah. And to the naked well, racism. Well, we've had that- two, two presidents of color. One was just, is just a color not assigned at birth. <laughs> <laughs> and that changes day to day. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the, the, it didn't help that the racism that marked the presidency of Barack Obama was so naked. And, and the fact that we elected a nakedly racist monster directly after him. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Here's the thing, though. Women I, I in do, LGBT. I do, Doug, resent the fact that you said that you said the word naked while I was picturing uh, Donald Trump. That's not. I'm not okay with that. And then you decided to share that with the world. Yeah. All right. Cleanse. Radical <laughs> honesty is what we do here. It's, Everybody it's drink our bleach. Thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, here's the thing: w- women in LGBTQ are born that way, atheists or not, or more correctly, everyone is born atheist. Right. But identifies as religious later in life. But that's exactly the point. If you're a woman or gay or queer, you cannot simply change your mind about that. But if you are religious, you absolutely can. And yet, we have never had a president who admitted to being an atheist. We have had Episcopalians, Presbyterians, Disciples of Christ, Congregationalists, Southern Baptists, Northern Baptists, Methodists, Unitarians, a Quaker, and a Catholic, but never an atheist. The closest we've gotten is Abraham Lincoln, who never professed to a specific religion, and Thomas Jefferson, who was a deist and who had very good reasons for not wanting to believe in hell, and (laughs) Donald Trump, who clearly does not believe in a higher power other than himself. Yeah, right. So moving down the ballot, you do find some notable atheists, but the list is not very long. Barney Frank, the congressman from Massachusetts, Mm -hmm. uh, ticked two of those boxes and serves as the exception that proves the rule. Yeah. Uh, he was and was. He is still alive, and I wish he was still in Congress because he's did he, such. A, did he openly admit he was atheist uh, all along? I don't know if it was all along, but he did. You know, I, I he came out while a congressman. Yeah, he was in Congress a long time, and I and he was. I know that he was an out atheist while in office. I don't know if he did it. You know when yeah, that I happened. Don't I don't um, believe it or not, we here in Deep Red Utah had an out atheist mayor of Salt Lake City. Rocky mm-hmm. Anderson. Um, that's pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. Um, in fact, of the current 538 members of the Congress, only five right now identify as unaffiliated, which is less right. than 1% of Congress. Hmm. So only 4% of Americans self-identify as you know atheist, but 26% self-identify as unaffiliated. Well, so and that you, depends on – those figures depend on where you look because I've seen as many as, – as high as 8% saying uh, atheist or agnostic. Yeah, and well, I think the, 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 the you can distinguish you – know, each of those things has their own little representation. So right. some percent are atheists, some percent are agnostic, some percent are unbelievers. But lump them together as an unaffiliated, it makes up um, 26%. Yeah. This that, makes the – That's not a small number. No. No. And but it makes the unaffiliated easily the most underrepresented group in the country. For sure. Oh yeah. Now imagine if you were an atheist of color or an LGBTQ atheist, there may not be a single elected member of government that truly represents you, or at least does so publicly. Yeah. So there's. I think Mormons are like one half of one percent at generously yeah. of the U.S. population, and I think there's eight or ten Mormons in uh, Congress. There's, there's a, we had a little bit of a downturn in this last Congress, um, oh, that's because, nice. but it was uh, Jeff Flake left the Congress, and oh, uh, that's too uh, bad. He was so useful. Uh, he was such a brave man. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, Mormons are hyper overrepresented. I mean, yeah. yeah, white men are clearly insanely overrepresented in this country. Yeah. Um, but this disparity was brought into sharp focus last week with the charade of a confirmation hearing of Amy Comey Barrett. The right tried to pretend that she was under attack for her religious beliefs, which Uncle Dan talked about last week, which are freaking troubling, yeah, her beliefs. Yeah. Uh, and, but the Democrats, however, being Democrats, did not, and I, if, correct me if I'm wrong, because I tried to watch as much of the hearings as I could, didn't ask her a single question about her far-right religious sp- uh, splinter group, which I personally think they should have, but I, I do yeah, too, and I don't think they did. <clears throat> it's be, the question. right did such a good job of getting out ahead of that and s- screaming about religious bigotry that the I think the the left was terrified to say anything. Yeah. And what's funny is that the right, the way the right were couching it was everybody's being bigoted against her Catholicism. Yeah, and nobody was mentioning the like sidecar cult that she was a part of. 
Yeah, exactly. And, and right, and that and that Barack Obama was attacked for eight years for being a secret Muslim, even though he went to church every Sunday. Right. And even the Christian denomination he went to, he got attacked for because the pastor was pretty outspoken. Or, or the fact that Joe Biden is Catholic. Yeah. Right. Right. I know, <clears throat> and an active Catholic, which I don't love, but there it is. Yeah. 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 Um, <clears throat> But all of that didn't stop the right from going out there and pretending that it's pretty hard for religious people in this country. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And then you have unctuous religious fanatics like Tom Cotton or our very own Mike Lee, who, while not actively spreading the coronavirus, is openly calling for the end of democracy. Yeah. I'm not sure. Did you guys see his tweet from the other day? Oh, yeah. Oh, my Um, God. Yeah. Yeah. Let's just make sure it's repeated here because it's fucking crazy. He said, quote, democracy isn't the objective. Liberty, peace, peace, and prosperity, he yeah. said prosperity, are. We want the human condition to flourish. Rank democracy can thwart that. Yeah. Well, first there of all, is, uh, yeah. First, rank democracy meaning fair elections. Yeah. Yeah. And first of all, you know how the, the Castilian Spanish uh, um, kind of affectation is said to have developed from courtiers flattering, was it Charles? Yeah, sure. King Carlos or whatever who had a lisp. Right. I, th- I think that now to curry favor with Trump, you have to put typos into your tweets, <laughs> right? So that's how that language is developing. Well, but yeah, gonna, this, oh, this canard that, the, that we're not a democracy, that we're a republic is so this stupid. distinction without a difference that was started by the John Birch Society right. when they were mad about the civil rights movement. And anyone who is tempted to use that argument in a debate, just let me put this marker down. It makes you sound stupid. Yeah. You think you're sounding smart. And, and, and old Mike Lee, you know, if you're going to call for the end of the American experiment, can you at least use spell check? For yeah, fuck's right. Sense. Yeah. So can we just spend a second on Mike Lee, our senator? Sure. Ugh. I cannot. St- this man is. I'm so disgusted to be represented by him in Congress. Yeah. Mike Lee looks like he just sold a monorail to Ogdenville. <laughs> you know what I mean? I think, I think he looks like your souffle fell, but it somehow still managed to put on a suit. <laughs> <laughs> I w- it's funny because uh, you know I'm not I'm not super into making fun of people's looks, but he does look like like a wax museum rejected him because they couldn't make him they they can't make him their thing look as waxy as he actually <laughs> looks. Really. He to look too lifelike. He looks like a French a French witch brought a brie to life on a hot day and and cursed it to sell insurance. <laughs> Mike Lee looks like a proctologist who's not in it for the money. <laughs> I think Mike Lee is like the Terminator, but if instead of Skynet becoming self-aware, it was vanilla pudding. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Do we Mike have Lee more is what we... not having a healthy dose of imposter syndrome looks like. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, Any more? Mike looks Lee like was a the, bitch. <laughs> Mike Lee was the original baby uh, with a bowl of spaghetti on his head from the classic poster. <laughs> Oh, Mike Lee, we hate you. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so this is not an exclusively American problem, obviously, not having or being, you know, atheists not being allowed to really uh, operate publicly in the, in the elected square. Um, but the list of countries that also have this problem are not what we should consider to be good company. Spare a thought again for our poor friend uh, Shabu and the plight of being an atheist in Uganda. Yeah. Yeah. But this is not nearly such a big problem for the more enlightened countries in the world. And let's give a big shout out to our Kiwi listeners. Uh, New yeah. Zealand just showed us all that this need not be a problem by re-electing Labor Party leader Jacinda Ardern, who is not only a former Mormon, but an admitted ag- agnostic and a woman. Yeah. So, you know, this can be done. Yeah. Uh, and it also bears mentioning that under her leadership, New Zealand has defeated the coronavirus. And their lives are basically back to normal. Yeah, and apparently she breastfed her newborn in cabinet meetings. Can you imagine the American right having to contend with this woman? No. Like, Ugh. they would they would come out of their skin. Yeah. I, I yearn for that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, it can happen. It just, it's just a matter. And, and that's really what I, what I want to get to here in a second. It, it bears mentioning, uh, oh, sorry, so that's a lot of throat clearing to get to this point. Uncle Dan, you and Frank have been um, encouraging more atheists to run for public office over on TGIA for several weeks now. That's right. And that's, the, that's obviously the right thing to do. Um, and so if any listeners who want to go over and listen to the, those, those, I think you've been doing it for four weeks now, is that right? 
Something like that. I don't yeah. know. That's a time question. I don't pay attention to those things. <laughs> time is a flat circle. That's right. Um, but today I want to talk a little bit more about the context within which atheists, for example, would have to run for Congress or any elected office. So just here are my two questions for you guys and, mm. and you know, to contend with and hopefully solve for all of us. <laughs> yeah, Why is we'll, atheism- we'll definitely take care of it. <laughs> Why is athe- atheism still so stigmatized, stigmatized in American elected office, and how can we change that environment? What can we do? So, well, here's solid. the thing: there is a, there was, and is a concerted effort to this end to yeah. demonizing atheists, and it's because this is all part of uh, Project Blitz, and before that, other thing. There was, you know, and this goes back to. Uh, before the Reagan era, but there was a dis- a concerted effort by the Republican Party to associate their name and their brand with Jesus. Mm. And that involved things like, because honestly, before this, this like very calculated effort, n- evangelicals didn't care about abortion. It was not a, an, an issue that was big on yeah, their radar this was, at all. This was Jerry Falwell being angry about um, segre- desegregation. <clears throat> yeah. yeah, yeah, and it does it, it does arise arise largely out of uh, hatred of black folks and hatred of uh, the civil liberties uh, movement, and uh, and so they decided that their best bet was a, a, a full frontal assault, demonizing. A group of uh, several groups of people to uh, and and instilling fear as the uh, as the thing that they would use to hold on to their base. And so, uh, yes, gay folks were demonized and uh, and uh, yeah, people of color were demonized. And this was, you know, this was all very, very uh, planned as a as a political tactic to get people on their side and to hold on to them. I and I, so yeah, that, I, so now we've got now we've got this a country where a non-believer has been it, it's been it's been beaten into the heads of the religious uh um, of religious America that we are we non-believers are worse than rapists. Yeah, and exactly. And so you get um um you know, otherwise intelligent people who who also happen to be believers. Um, and I'm not saying all believers are stupid. I'm just making a point here that they uh, can, will ask you with a straight face. Well, why don't you just go rape and murder people to this right. day? Like to, to say that about atheists, yeah. because that that has been so successfully. It's like it's like, you know, Dan said about uh the, the Republicans working the, the refs to make it so the Democrats couldn't even ask a question about this cult she belonged to. Right. Uh, Amy Cody Barrett. Um, that's how successful <laughs> the poisoning has been, is that you would like, if people find out you're an atheist, they won't let you babysit their kids. Right? Right. right. But it's, it's a, it enters specifically among professions. Mm. It enters the conversation in politics in a way that it does not among doctors or airline pilots or engineers, Mm -hmm. right? Like, you know, if you're an airline pilot, no one knows what your affiliation is. No one asks you, you know, you don't have to talk about it. Right. But in American politics, you have to talk about it articulately, unless you're Donald Trump and it's in two Corinthians. But you know what I mean? Like, why is it that, of course, I want to lament the fact that we require our leaders to pre- talk about Jesus and, and, you know, go to church on Sunday and say, God bless America. And right. Exactly. Right. But why are we stuck in this? Mo- if Democrats are an opposition party and we've gotten to a place as a party where we can talk about being pro-choice unabashedly, which many Democrats do, why can't we have that? Con- why, why can't we make that evolution on religion? Well, I think it's very distasteful, to be honest. <clears throat> well, for, for many reasons. But I, th- I find it very distasteful when politicians talk too much about, like, very much about God. Right. Like, if fine. If, you're a, if you go to church on Sunday and that's what I don't care, right? That's fine. And if you want to mention Jesus once or twice, I don't give a shit. In, and in the same way, I think it would be strange— for an atheist, 
uh, candidate for office or office holder to lead with atheism. Yeah. Right. I think it's right. I think if you don't lead with it, you don't hide it, but you don't lead with it would be my advice. Right. So I it, think that I, I think that part of the issue here is that these, <clears throat> you know, the when this happened, when when they uh, when the conservative right uh, started this kind of messaging, the left never caught up. No, they never figured it out. Because the counter messaging is actually really simple. It's, I mean, I was raised sort of in the 80s. There was this general notion that was taught to me, which was America's a big melting pot. It's for, it's decidedly for everyone. You're all supposed to be here and we're all supposed to learn from each other and take the good things of everybody's, you know, culture. And they ruined that. They broke that. Mm -hmm. If the left had had stuck to that and said, "Look, I, you know, I, the reason that I'm not going to talk about God too much is because I want to honor all of my fellow Americans, and not everyone believes in that. And you know, I want to honor my Hindu American brethren, and I want to honor my, you know, my Confucian American brethren, or whatever, and my non-believing uh, Americans." If they had hit that hard, if that messaging had been effectively put out there as a counter to this religious thing, we'd be in a different place right now. Yeah. But it didn't get out there because they were they were taken completely by surprise by this whole uh, uh, strategy. Well, so much of our politics right now are, you know, the right has had a concerted agenda for 40 years or more. But, you know, from the Reagan revolution to today. Yeah, it's been about judges. It's been about voter suppression, and it's worked. Right? They are a minority party, and they are running government. You know, across the fucking board. Yeah. Um. And you know they've they the statistics on Supreme Court justices alone are so gallingly you know maddening because you know the uh, Republicans have appointed I forget it's some giant majority of the last ten Supreme Court justices and several of those presidents. We're not elected by a majority of Americans. It goes on right. and on. Yeah, and and the and the confirmations were made by senators who you know represent vanishingly small segments of who our represents population. you know essentially represent empty space. Right. Yeah. yeah. But you know, I the way I look at this and and tell me you know what you guys think of this is not long ago, not many years ago, in in, in well within the lifetime of everyone who's listening to this podcast. The, what has happened with gay rights and gay marriage um, was inconceivable. Inconceivable. Mm -hmm. Sure. Right. You know, the, I mean, those of us who remember well the Bush administration in 2004 presidential campaign, which was based on homophobia, yeah. and they won. Um, to, from that time to get to where we are now, there, there's many, many things that happened, but something happened, right? Like, yeah. And, and I kind of think if there's a way for atheists to find our way out or, and you know out of our closet, so to speak, and into the, the, the limelight, especially in elected office, the culture has to experience some kind of a change. And I'm I'm curious, how, you know, what you guys think was the impetus for that. I know there were more than one, and there were many, and there were many people who did a lot of work, but that they did it right for, like, for kind of the general acceptance of queer queer rights and that sort of thing. Yeah. And, and I, I know we're far from being where we want to be, but we're a lot closer than I thought we'd be in 2020. Well, as a queer kid, you know, growing up in the 70s and 80s, I didn't think these days would ever occur. Yeah, exactly. Right? So, um, yeah, I, you know, obviously a, a huge amount of that was what I would call cultural power, or soft power, right? And that was kind of um, Hollywood that was putting, and I hate to say like will and grace, I hate to say it's a, uh, totally a positive um, uh, examination of queer existence because it was right. kind of a minstrel show. Um, and gay people were, you know, beloved characters, but they were also ridiculous parodies. But things like that, and now, you know, Ellen DeGeneres, who's turned out to be a horrible human being, but, her, <laughs> you know, her coming out on her show. And, and those things were tremendously important. That's part of it. Um, I also think society becoming and this was mirrored in what you were saying earlier about the Christian right and them working the refs. Um, but society has has started at that point to become less and less religious 
And that's also went a long way towards um, towards that kind of acceptance. I, I, I think that, you know, portrayals of atheists as not being monsters is important. And I will, with all possible humility, say I think that's part of what we're trying to do here. Yeah, I, I think that's right. I mean, yeah, I, I think so. I, I also think that we need to take more pages from the LGBTQ playbook uh, because since, you know, uh, Stonewall and since, since, you know, going back to the 70s, 60s, 70s, gay people made it a point to come out yep. uh, and, and to be open and to, to take be enormous visible. risks and come out. Yeah. yeah, when it was very, very dangerous for them to do so. Yeah. Because they knew that the visibility was the only thing that was going to make them human. Yeah. And uh, and I think when people, you know, when mothers started finding out that their own child was gay or, you know, when, when somebody's favorite niece or nephew was gay, uh, suddenly it wasn't just this theoretical thing that they could hate, but it was a person that they loved. It was a face that they had to contend with. Yeah. And so I think part of our job as uh, non-believers, as heretics in the world, if it's safe to do so, or if you're brave enough to do so, is to be open and out and public about your non-belief. Yeah, if yeah. you're able. I, I think of the, you know, and it, this is a courageous thing, but I think about our, our friend Vern and his, you know, lovely cohort of uh, young people at Utah Valley University who have a secular student alliance club and they table, like they show their faces and say, come talk to us, ask us about, you know, atheism and secularism. And that's, that's brave. And that's, that's the, those are the kind of steps that need to be taken to make this happen, I think. Well, and I think, you know, if you think about, to your point, Uncle Mark, too, that um, there's not a lot of <clears throat> atheist content, so to speak, you know, because mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Will and Grace, it's, it's on everyone's list because it happened and there's no denying that it had an effect. It was in the right place at the right time, yes. Yeah. 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 And there's that apocryphal story. I don't know if it's true or not, but I, I do love it of when... Um, Michelle Nichols. Uh, Michelle Nichols wanted to quit Star Trek because she didn't like, you know, kind of how she was being portrayed as, you know, the short skirt and it's stuff. kind of a piece of ass on the show, yeah. And Martin Luther King came to her and said, you need to stay on the show. We need black women yeah. on Black TV. little girls have to see someone that looks like them on television. Yeah, and I think the, the most <clears throat> of the content we have as atheists is, you know, it's antagonistic, and, and I certainly understand that. It's things like the God delusion and... But there's not many portrayals of atheists in our pop culture that are positive. There's just not very many portrayals of atheists at all. And it's what's so right. strange about that is Hollywood is disproportionately atheist. Yeah, it's <laughs> weird. And the people writing the shows and making the shows and acting in the shows are, by and large, non-believers. But we don't have a lot of that content we can point to that's not angry or, or kind of vitriolic because a lot of us are, you know, pretty scarred by what happened to us. Yeah. Well, a, a lot of people are trying to, uh, to, to remedy that, you know, it, a few years back, uh, about five years ago, there was a, uh, a writing competition that was sponsored by the center for inquiry in Los Angeles. That was about trying to write a sitcom, basically trying to write our will and grace uh. that was about, you know, just portraying, uh, non-believers in a po- in a light that wasn't like, you know, they're either sort of unfeeling robots like the guy on uh, Big Bang Theory, or they're sort of grumpy monsters like House, right? Or you know, they're, they're just trying to get some representation out there, and you know, uh, it didn't go anywhere. I should know. I won that competition. Oh, really? <laughs> but. Uh, <clears throat> But it, uh, you know, it, the effort is out there. We just need to increase it a lot. Yeah, yeah, it, I, I agree. And and you know, it's really funny. You guys is Dan. You know, on thank God I'm atheist. You had our uh, our state senator Derek Kitchen on as we were talking Correct. about earlier. Yeah, who is a personal friend of mine. I've known for a long time, and I don't think I knew he was I officially knew he was an atheist until yeah, I heard him on your show. He's not. He's not. It's not a point that he makes uh, a big issue about. 
Yeah. But it it means a lot to me, and I think it meant a lot to a, a lot of our listeners that he was willing to say it. Yeah, I thought that, that was willing- fantastic. And that goes back to what I was saying a bit earlier. It's like, you know, what's so distasteful about the the Christians, some of the Christians who are in office, is just how fucking that is their whole, that's the tip of their spear. That's the yeah. entire conversation. Yeah. And, and I wouldn't want an atheist running for office to be that person. Right. Because that's, not, you know, yes, religion factors into a lot of problems in America. But, you know, we, we elected you to fill the potholes and keep the lights on. Yeah. And right. atheism doesn't make you a good politician. No. By or, any, a good or, or a good person. Yeah. Right. But here's the thing is, is, and this might be a little late in the day to bring this up, but it's, it's that um, I don't want, to your, both of your point, I don't want someone to run for office on an atheist ticket or an atheist platform. Right. I just want atheists to be able to run for office. Yes. Yeah. And I think that by and large, you know, believing in science, not believing in fairy tales is a positive. And, you know, religious people have pretty much exclusively run this country low these 240 years and have cocked it up pretty goddamn hard. Yeah. And, and, and you know, at least being willing to try to protect the secular space in which everyone can live. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And so, I, I mean, I, I, I like I, the point that they cocked it up because it's not like an atheist can do worse. Right. <laughs> right. So, I mean, I think, I, I think, you know, to bring this full circle, yeah, I think we need to try and, and, and you're right, Mark, we're trying to do this now. Yeah, this yeah. podcast is an attempt to humanize made, atheism, we, humanize atheism and, and make, give it a, you know, a happy face because I think it's a happy life. It's a totally yeah. happy life. Yeah. And, and, you know, we should, we should be seen as more positive than we are seen because we are, we're good people. There are bad atheists. There's bad but, apples in every goddamn bushel. Yeah, but and not every atheist is going to be a leftist either. No, you know, there, we, there's we're, plenty we're examples of that. shitty right wing atheists. You know. <laughs> yep. Well, so. I think we solved it. Yes, I so think so. I'd like to end this segment if you'll give me a point of personal order with actually casting my ballot. I'm going to write in my. Uh, you hear that? Are you voting Both. on the air, Doug? I'm voting on the air. Boom. Is that illegal? Am I going to get in trouble for this? I don't think so. I think I, President I don't Kanye think we're, will I don't think you. anybody can get in trouble in America for anything anymore. So yeah, <laughs> laws don't ma- matter. So I'm not going to go do the whole ballot because it's long and I don't know who a lot of these people are, I have to admit. Um, <laughs> but I am going to fill in the circle for Kanye West and Michelle Tidball. <laughs> right on poor Michelle, Michelle Tidball. Tidball. Who is do? Who do you think she is? Like, how does she get dragged into this? I have no idea. <laughs> yeah, she's probably one of his back backup dancers or something. That... She's probably his personal assistant. She's like, oh, she's fuck probably a, a serious person who actually wants to be a a a, a politician, and this was her only way. Yeah. In. Well, okay. So here we go. I've got bad news for her. Right. <laughs> All right, Joseph R. Biden and Kamala D. Harris, I am filling in the bubble right now. Boom, baby. Oh, that feels good. Yeah. And then let's do I li- one I more. I like after, after that whole discussion, you go in and vote for a, a Catholic. So. <laughs> yeah, a Catholic. And is, is Kamala Hindu? I don't no, know. she's... I don't know. She's some sort of Christian. She's yeah. some but version of Christian. Listen, I... I, uh, I you, perhaps one of the only things I have in common with women of color is, you know, you got to be pretty pragmatic about your candidates. <laughs> Right. right. Yeah, exactly. Like you kind of have to voting for the lesser of two evils is the alternative because voting for the greater of two evils is monstrous. Is is yeah. more evil. And is I, more evil. I, I tweeted the other day that dropping my uh, my ballot in the uh, county drop off box this year felt less like a guy dropping uh, mailing a letter and more like one of the senator senators angling for his shot to stab Caesar. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Just good motherfucker, come here. Let me in there. So one one more thing before we go, it's the it's Constitutional Amendment C. Um, this is a weird way to end this. Shall the Utah Constitution be amended to make the following changes to the Utah Constitution's ban on slavery and involuntary servitude? <laughs> Remove the language that allows slavery and involuntary ser- involuntary servitude as punishment for a crime, and clarify that the ban does not affect the otherwise lawful admi- uh, administration of the criminal justice system. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and put I'm for yes. banning slavery in yes. 2020. Yeah. Nice. There we go. Spoke Brigham Young in the eye with that one, Doug. I feel pretty good about that. There uh, you go. I suck did it. it. All right. Well, thanks for that. Uh, go out there and vote. Go out there and run for office. And show your beautiful faces and speak your truth. I think that's, that's how right. we're going to build a co- we're going to build a future. That's right. All right. Thanks. Love you guys. you guys. Moving on. Well, 
all, friends, that's it for this week's show. Hey, we love to hear from you. If you uh, are a witch, send us an email at howto at howtoheretic.com. Or if you think there's any uh, Mike Lee burns we missed, why don't you call and leave us a message uh, with those at 903-88-HOW-TO, which is 903-884-6986. Uh, I'm also on Twitter at howtoheretic. Again, for any further Mike Lee burns, all will be accepted. And thanks to our all of a sudden way more numerous patrons. We love you. Yep. And thank you, Cody Layton, for editing the show. And thanks to all of you, dear friends, for tuning in. Bye, friends. You design. Mike Lee is a self-burn. <laughs> <laughs>